Good evening. Folks doing okay? Good. I'm glad. <laughs> Stay awake. <laughs> this week on Fox, as I was, I always look at the news on my phone just to see what's going on. An interesting story this week that went, goes well with what I'm going to speak this evening on. A couple's plan for a better life has been sunk. Nikki Walsh, 24, and boyfriend Tanner Broadwell, 26, decidedly, decided nearly a year ago that they were tired of working. Okay. <laughs> How can we live our lives when we're working most of the day and you have to pay so much just to live? Wash, who uh, booked timeshare tours for the living, said to the New York Post, most of the work you do goes to your home. There has to be another option. So the Colorado couple sold all their furniture, their SUV, and purchased a 49-year-old boat in Alabama to live on and eventually sail around the world in. The couple moved onto their 28 a uh, foot boat, although it said 49, or 49, yeah, 28 foot boat, which was in the marina of Tarpon Springs, a town in Florida's Gulf Co course, Coast, and lived there for months with their two-year-old pug, Remy, while they stocked up on food and supplies. We were pretty well prepared and gathered items to last for their planned trip to the Caribbean. Sounds pretty good, right? Got your boat. You're going to sell off to the Caribbean. You're just going to have a great time. No work. You don't have to worry about house payments or fixing the house. Nearly two days into their venture, the couple's boat capsized in a channel of water called John's Pass. We thought the canal was where we were going, but it wasn't, Wash told the Post, telling the publication they were armed with GPS and paper navigational charts. Local boat captains say the sandbars often shift in John's Pass, the Post reported. We started freaking out because waves were coming and it was tossing our boat back and forth. Broadwell was in the rear of the boat holding Remy, the dog, when the trouble hit. My hands were shaking. We were terrified, she said. Gets even better. Before abandoning ship, Wash said they grabbed some clothes and important documents as well as things for their dog. I also grabbed Remy's food and just about everything he needed. He doesn't deserve to go without his favorite toys. Wash admitted she and her boyfriend, who used to drive for Uber, were new to selling. However, the couple, losing their boat, who has been left with $90 in cash, no jobs, no boat, no insurance, say they will st they're still hopeful of selling around the world. So if you are interested in helping this couple tonight, you can go on to GoFundMe, begging people to help them, and they need $10,000 to raise their boat. Already they have $6,500. So if you'd like to do that today, you can help this couple get their boat back and going so they can enjoy the good life. <laughs> now that's pretty, pretty wild, don't you think? But on more on a serious note, think about our culture. We are one of the most abundant cultures in the world. All you have to do to, to see that, go to some third world country, and the things that we take for granted are in such abundance here. Fresh water, bathing, daily food, all these things that, you know, cable TV, our phones, and all these things, and we think, wow. And yet, in a culture of such wealth, we are sometimes the most discontented people. Would you agree with that? Always wanting a little bit more, maybe a little bit better car, bigger home, more of this, more of that. And again, the Bible never teaches wealth is not wrong. Matter of fact, many Old Testament saints were very wealthy. But what is the issue? The issue is self-sufficiency in self rather than self-sufficiency in Christ. Tonight, I'd like to ask the question, how do we find contentment? How do we find contentment in Christ? Contentment is not going to be learned by going to grad school. Contentment is going to be learned by practice and experience through all circumstances, trusting in the sufficiency of Christ. Did you hear that? 
trusting in the sufficiency of Christ. If you take your Bibles this evening, turn to Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Let me read this passage. Just stand for the reading of God's word. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Now that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being both filled and going hungry, both having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. First of all, and you can maybe see, the first thing I want you to see here, we must be content in all circumstances. The Apostle Paul is sharing his idea of contentment. It is a biblical idea of contentment. He is going to share how he lived life. And Paul had his ups and downs, right? And so right off the bat, we can rejoice in God's people who care. He is here referring to those who were helping him in ministry. That's why he starts off, but I rejoice. I am glad in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. The idea of rejoicing was the opportunity of those from Macedonia, which they were not very wealthy up there, but this would be northern Greece. Churches up there, Thessaloniki and numerous churches up there, were supporting Paul and his ministry. And so it, he was rejoicing in their support. The New Living Translation has, I like the way they put it, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Now, what does he mean by that? You have revived your concern for me. At last signifies a delay. It wasn't that they didn't want to help, but Paul's circumstances pretty much negated them helping. And the reason why was this. There were a group of people that were always hounding Paul. Now, Paul says, look, was he a tent maker? Yes, he, was, he, he made tents to help his support, but he was also receiving support from churches. But there were these people. You have basically, they kept dogging him about receiving funds from churches. That's why some people stopped. He said, look, I'm getting hounded by these folks, so I would prefer... For now, don't give me anything because these people are constantly telling me that I shouldn't be getting anything from anybody. Well, does the scripture teach that? No, the scripture doesn't teach that. And that's why he says here, you have revived. The word literally means a plant shooting up, becoming green and flourishing again. It means active again, caring for someone, renewing your care for someone. It's like a tree putting out fresh buds in the spring. These people cared for Paul, and Paul wanted their help, and yet because of these Pharisees and these so-called people that constantly caused him trouble. And so Paul, always wanting to be above reproach, at times refused taking help. He just did. And sometimes we lack opportunity to help. And that's why it says here, if you look in your Bibles, indeed, you were concerned Who's he referring to there? He's referring to these churches that wanted to help him. They were concerned for his well-being. You kept on not having opportunity to help me. You lacked opportunity. You lacked the occasion. But why did they lack opportunity? Again, in Thessaloniki and in Corinth, Paul had accepted aid, but he was being ridiculed for accepting people's help in the ministry. Now, we know throughout the scripture, it says the ox is worthy of its what? Yeah, and the man of God is worthy of, yes, there is nothing wrong in supporting a pastor or a missionary. They are serving the Lord, and they receive their support by those that they serve. Same thing in the Old Testament, the Levites. The Levites depended upon the sacrifices of God's people to feed them and to be able to survive. Well, as you continue lacking, seeing here, they lacked opportunity. But then Paul would go on to the idea of, look, we need to learn contentment. 
Now, that I speak in verse 11, from one, not that I speak from one, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Contentment is learned by practice and experience. This word here, learned, comes to the realization uh, with the implication of not coming through instruction, but coming through practice, learning, opportunity. How do you and I learn how to be content? You're not going to learn it in a book. You can go to 101, How to Be Contentment, at a Bible college. And you can, you can learn everything about contentment. And yet contentment must be found on an everyday basis by how we practice what we do. By how much we have or how much less we have. Paul is not being demanding here. And I'm not speaking as coming up short with his want. Not that I speak from coming up short. But I have learned from the long school of life centered on Christ. Paul has learned to adjust to outward circumstances such as waiting on their support and aid. Paul would not bellyache if the support wasn't there. He would, again, be what? He would be content. If he had much, he was content. If he had little, he was what? Content. That was his attitude. Contentment, again, is learned by practice and experience. But contentment is learned by the sufficiency of Christ. This word, to be content, is really the word for self-sufficiency. That's how we translate it. You're going like, wait, you just told me that we're not supposed to be self-sufficient? Well, listen to what this word means. This word has the concept of having enough. And the word indicates an inward self-sufficiency as opposed to the lack of something. It indicates independence from external circumstances. So here's the question. All right, I was expecting chicken today, and I didn't get chicken today. I got what? I got pot roast and potatoes and carrots. And I could say what? I don't like pot roast, potatoes, and carrots. But that's what's served, and what do you learn to be in that situation? And again, I like pot roast, so I'm just making this as though it was, it was good. But what do you do if you're not getting what you want? What is our normal response when we don't get what we want? We like to gripe and complain. Or we look at our neighbors and say, well, why do they have more than us? Or why does so-and-so in the congregation, they always never have to struggle. Well, is that contentment? No, that's not contentment. That's what? Yes. And Paul here, he had been through all circumstances, and he says, I have learned. This is something that you learn. In every circumstance, I have learned how to be content. I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to get along in prosperity. I put in my notes, contentment is by the sufficiency of Christ. This, this sufficiency that he's referring to is not self-sufficiency in himself, but it's self-sufficiency in Christ alone. Because later on he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. All of us have to take a heart check once in a while. And the reason why I am on this subject, I have been reading a particular Puritan, uh, Jeremiah Burroughs, on, on contentment. Now, if you ever read any Puritan stuff, it's long, it's wordy, but it's good if you, can stay, if you can stay with them. But our culture, we just, our church culture doesn't read Puritans because they say, man, these guys are just, they just write so much. And yet these Puritans are very, very apt in their understanding of life because they lived in difficult times. I mean, they, had, they basically got booted out of Europe and they came to America. In England, they weren't accepted because they were basically saying, look, there shouldn't be a state church. We should be able to worship as we want. We don't have to join the Church of England. Well, that didn't work so well. And so they were persecuted. Most of them lost everything. And they came to America to start again. And yet our culture just likes to bash Puritans, you know, puritanical. If you ever get called puritanical, is that a good word? No, they're, they're really saying, look, you guys need to loosen up a bit. Well, the Puritans were some of the most joyful people you'd ever want to meet. And their theology was very good and very profound. 
And so as I'm reading this, it's not so much self-sufficiency as Christ-sufficiency. And yet content is, does learn in little and in plenty. Again, there's nothing wrong with having a lot, of, a lot of things as long as those things don't do what? Yes, or become idols, or become like, I've got to have this. <laughs> do what? Obsession. Yes, obsession. Yes, it, you are driven to, to move up to the next level in your social status. You're not satisfied here because you have to move here. And then when you get here, what happens? You move, you got to move up again. And you just go through this. It's the hamster on the, you've seen the hamster running like crazy and doing what? Going nowhere. And yet we live in a culture that just look when you watch TV, like I've been watching, I watched the Olympics and, and it's, and it's, Basically, not all of it, but a lot of it's trying to sell us stuff. If you watch any sporting program, you're going to see a lot of commercials on, obviously, beer, because if you have beer, you're going to be content, because the more beer you have, the more content. Or you've got to have a bigger car. You know, if you have this wonderful Buick car, life is good. Right? Well, you can have a big Buick car and life can stink. Right? <laughs> But our culture is so driven on the aspect of having more that they are not content. And yet, the sad thing is, many of God's people are not content either. All you have to do is catch yourself complaining about something. Complaining about something. Because when we're complaining, what are we doing? We are really being discontented, are we not? Oh, man, well, we don't go on there too much. That's, that's, getting, that's getting a little, yeah. We'll move on. This little and plenty. Look in your Bibles here. I know how to get along with humble means, and also I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance as well as suffering need. Paul learned that humble means. The word humble means by disciplining oneself to live with abundance, uh, abundance, uh, having it, or also being poor. Uh, this word here, which is he's learning the secret of being filled and going hungry, the idea here is used in other parts of Christ in Philippians chapter 2 of humbling himself. Because think of Christ. What did Christ have before he entered time space into our, into our world? What did he have? Yes, he had everything which he deserves. Worship, praise, adoration, angels ministering to him. He had it all, and yet what did he do? He humbled himself. That's the word that Paul is talking about. He says, I am willing to humble myself in all circumstances. What did Christ do? He came, he gave up everything so that he could minister to whom? To you and I. Christ came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give himself a ransom for many. Christ gave up all the riches of heaven so that he could come and live a humble life with us in order to proclaim himself and to identify with our needs. Like I said this morning, he is not some bystander to the needs of people. He knows. He knows. He knows very well. And because of that, I have learned the secret, the mystery of being filled and going hungry. And then Paul goes on to say, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We are able to be content in Christ and connect with others in distress. I am able, the idea have power, have competency, to be able to do this. And who enables me to do this? Christ enables me. Because if you want to do this by your own willpower, we are, what is our nature? Our natures are basically what? Selfish. Do you have to teach kids to be selfish? <laughs> when they're able to do anything, what's the first thing they say? No, I want this. No, I don't want this. Give me this. Give me that. And they will fight over toys. They will fight over everything. You give them this kind of food. They don't want that food. They want this food. Right? Our nature within ourselves we are very selfish people, but we are thankful that through Christ, he can change our hearts to be content 
and to be satisfied with whatever state we're in. I'm sure in this, in this congregation you have people who struggle financially, and you probably have people in here that do quite well financially. You have people here that are going like, man, how am I going to make these payments this week or this month? And you're, and you're just wrestling with the checkbook, and you say, well, I need $800, but there's only $400 there. And other people, they say, well, you know, no big, I have you know, 200000 in my checking account. It's like, it's not that big a deal. Is there anything wrong with having 200000 in your checking account? And the answer is, no. But God provides for each person with what they need. And that's why Paul, in all circumstances, he says, I can do all things. Because you know what this does to you? This is the greatest lesson that you learn on contentment, is when things are taken away, when things are removed, what do you say to God? Remember Job? Did he lose a few things? Remember? Did he lose his family? Did he lose all of his material wealth? Did he lose his health? And of course, his wife wasn't very supportive. You know, curse God and die. That was lovely. I'm sure she was a godly woman, but she probably was what? Very what? Yeah. And yet Job can say, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Did he have contentment? Was that a man who was content in all circumstances? With most of us, take away our health, and most of us are going to say, Lord, why am I going through this health crisis? Because we all want our health, right? And we say, Lord, I just don't feel good. Well, the older you get, the less, you know, unless you're, yeah, we start not feeling so good. And the first thing we want to do is complain to the Lord. But we do it with very serpy, Lord God, I am so glad you are my, you benefit me and you, you constantly are watching over me. But I'd really like to get rid of this arthritis because this is really bothering me. So if you could do that for me, please, I'd be really glad. And you think, well, nobody prays that way. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, come on. Right? Are you with me on this? Yeah, to, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm pressing home the point. And that's why when you learn contentment, notice what Paul says here. When you learn contentment, nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my what? Affliction. The word affliction means oppression. The word can be translated tribulation. It has the idea of troubles that distress us. And with this, this concept, also the empathy, the, sim, sim, the sympathy that we can give people, because most of us say, well, the reason why that person is struggling, if they really learn to work hard and manage their money better, they wouldn't be in that situation. Have you ever said that? <laughs> right? You go like, well, that's a lot of sympathy there. Well, they don't need sympathy. They just need to learn some good old hard work, and that will get them out of there. I mean, isn't that what we think? Yeah, that's what we think. Rarely do we have, wow, man, they're really going through a hard time. And, uh, and what were these people willing to do for Paul when he was having want and needs? They were willing to do what? To supply his needs. Now, if Paul didn't get it, did he complain? No, because he's learned to be what? Content in all circumstances, whether in lack or in much. No matter what was going on in Paul's life, he was content. He delighted. And when he was receiving support, he said, praise God. And if it wasn't coming, he would still say what? Praise God. <laughs> if he was hungry, and we can go through those passages in Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, I mean, shipwreck, distress, beaten, you know, you're going like, well, lovely life. Right? But yet, that's the same Paul who says, rejoice in the Lord always. <laughs> Again, I say rejoice. And that is found in Philippians. Man, there's a lot to learn there, isn't there? Right? When I was pastoring in Madrid, Spain, um, on any given Sunday, as I told the elders, that um, we could have over 20 nationalities on any given Sunday. Um, our church 
was, well, the ceiling fell in on our sanctuary, a, a piece of cement, the way, I mean, they structures in Spain are sort of weird. It was a big hacienda that we bought. So this uh, cement thing during the middle of Bible study fell right smack in the middle. Fortunately, nobody was killed. I mean, just, what would you like to be studying? Next thing you know, here comes a 600 pound little thing falling through the roof. And so we, so we had to, uh, we ended up moving outside. We didn't have any place to go. So we had church outside, and it was sort of weird because we were running about 80 people, and within two months, we were running 140. The word got out, church that's outside, the church that meets under the tree. <laughs> and Africans, they love that concept because that's, most of them don't have church buildings. A lot of them have to meet outside. And so guess who started coming to church? A lot of the African refugees were coming to church. And I said, man, praise God. And then eventually we were able to gut one of our, it was our basically nursery plus children's department, so we gutted the place. And yet God was always good. I'm talking about Filipino ladies who came to Spain. Most of them worked as housewives or cleaning. They were not making a lot of money. I mean, in a year's time, they might make Eh, if they were fortunate, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars, and in Spain, that's not a lot. And yet, when we needed to start our building fund, and it was going to cost us four hundred thousand to do what they needed to do, maybe a little bit more. And I never look at money. I try to stay away with that. You know, I have pastor friends says you should always look at money. You should know what people are giving. You know, if you got them in leadership and they're not giving, that's a problem. So, I, but I never looked. And so one day, one of the Filipino ladies, I found out how much she was going to give for the building project. Now remember, they're making twelve to fifteen thousand. She wrote a check out for five thousand dollars. Do the math on that. She gave a third of her income that year. And then I started finding out they were all doing that. And so I just like, I got mad. I said, What are you ladies doing? You can't afford to give that kind of money. And all of them would say, don't you tell us, Pastor, God has always been sufficient. He will always be sufficient, and he will always take care of us. How dare you insult us? I go, whoa. <laughs> Those are the kind of people I had in this church. I think of Johnson, who came from Liberia during the Civil War. It was a nightmare in Liberia back in the 70s. Um, basically, it was two tribes that were basically exterminating each other. Uh, Johnson's tribe was in a village where they were attacked. The whole village was destroyed. Soldiers going around just gunning people down, just executing them. Johnson and his family hovered in, a, in their house and just prayed for God's protection. And by God's miracle, the soldiers, even though everybody else was being burned out and shot, they went by that house. None of his family was killed. And yet Johnson, as he was with all this carnage going on, they were migrating to different places. And so Johnson was moving to a different country, and yet they had roadblocks. The opposing tribe, they knew by your speech where you were from, all right? They could tell. And so here's this, this, this honking guy. I mean, you had to see him. He never lifted weights, but he looked like the Hulk. I kid you not. I mean, he just, his muscles just bulged. He was this guy you didn't want. You were glad he was on, my, on our side. <laughs> And so as he's walking across the bridge, he realized that this particular tribe was isolating others and executing them. Well, he hoped that he would be able to get through. So as he was getting through, he, he was almost through, but someone was able by his dialect or by the way he spoke, they got him and they executed him. You say, well, wait a second. If he was in your church, how was he? They shot him thinking they killed him. They shot him in the back of the head. I don't know how you survived that, but he did. So they threw him with a bunch of bodies, and they left, and he got up and walked five miles and, and survived. So this man was one of my deacons, Johnson. Oh, by the way, Johnson was one of the top boxers in Liberia. He, his coach, he was training for the Olympics, would have been the 1981 or 82 Olympics. <laughs> In his boxing weight, he was one of the top contenders for a medal in the world. He was, like I said, an incredible specimen of a hunk of a man. And so in Liberia, you have to pay your coaches off in order 
to go to the Olympics. If you don't pay your coach off, you know, like 30% of what you're making, then the coach will basically, will figure out a way not to take you. Well, Johnson, by he refused to do it. He says, I, I'm not gonna pay you. So, he missed the Olympic team. The coach came back and said, Johnson, man, I am so, I, Johnson, you would have medaled in the Olympics. You probably would have got a silver or possibly a gold. That's how good he was. And so he comes to Spain with nothing. I mean, just dirt poor. He ends up, he knows the Lord. He comes to, the, to uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Madrid. And, and if you would see Tom, or if you would see Johnson, the first thing you would know, notice was his, his infectious smile. The guy had these gleaming pearl teeth and was dark, as about as dark as you can get. And he would just come up and say, man, God is so good. And you're like, Johnson, man, you're dirt poor, Johnson. <laughs> Johnson, uh, I mean, we're, you, you hardly have, I mean, he was basically an ostrich farmer for some Spaniard in, outside of Madrid. So he took care of ostriches. And, uh, but he, he would just say, I'd say, Johnson, how you doing? He says, well, I could do better, and I could do worse, but life is good. Praise the Lord. That was his attitude. The guy was so crazy. He'd come into my office, and he would say, uh, Pastor, I need a pen. I'd pull out my, i say, here, here's 20 pens. Which one do you want? He says, no, I don't want one of your pens. I want the pen that God will give me. I go like, Johnson, what are you talking about? Johnson, what are you talking about? God's pen. He says, no, I'm going to go out and God's going to give me a pen. I said, okay, Johnson, go find God's pen. This is one of my deacons. So five hours later, he comes back, and he's got this big old smile. I said, well, Johnson, did you find God's pen? Well, yes, God gave me a pen. He pulls it out. It's like a $40 pen. I go, Johnson, where'd you get that? <laughs> well, I was just walking along, praying and praising God, and all of a sudden, I looked down in the street, and there was this beautiful pen. And so I stood there most of the day asking people if there was their pen. And after three or four hours, the, the guy who owned the store came out and says, hey, you can have that pen. You've been out all day. It's your pen now. So he said, he came back smiling. This is God's pen. It's be is this better than any of your pens? I go, yeah, it's a little bit better than my pens. You know what I, you know he was teaching me? That guy was teaching me self-sufficiency in Christ. Same church with another elder, Daryl. Daryl was a, a Navy pilot, a captain. He basically tracked uh, Russian subs who carried nuclear weapons, nuclear warheads. That's what he did for 20 years. He basically then, he was a businessman, to make a short story, he became a fourth letter level loan officer for Citibank. Daryl, with one stroke of his pen, could loan out $500 million. He was one of the highest in Spain. He was the highest in Spain and Portugal. He had, everybody had to come to him in order, whatever they, so here's Daryl. So I've got Johnson, who's dirt poor, but I have Daryl, who's very wealthy. And yet with both of these men, the, the, their character, their love for Christ, and their sufficiency in him, both of them were very content. You know what Daryl would do all the time? Daryl was one in the church who, no matter who it was, he would be able to supply the needs of a lot of people who just were struggling coming to Spain. And it was not uncommon for Daryl just to, he always, he always had a wad of money on him. And, and, he, and if you know, knew Daryl, Daryl was from South Texas. You would never know this guy was, was a loan officer, fourth level loan officer for Citibank because he was just so common. And so, just so easy to, to and he would invite us to his house, beautiful house, big swimming pool. And he was just like, man, this is, God gave this to me, and I just want to use this for God. And so it was not uncommon for people at our church who were struggling, he, and he would do it in a way not to embarrass them. He would go and talk to them, and he, said, and he would, whatever they needed, he would give them that money and just and say, you know, the Lord has provided for me for so much, and I just want to help you. And he made it in such a way that people were never felt uncomfortable by him. And yet we had Filipino ladies that would write one-third of their check, and we had other people in that church that would write it. I mean, they ended up raising like $700,000 in three days. How would you like to raise, raise $700,000 in three days? Because we had people that could write checks out for 100000 and not blink. And we had Filipinos who were giving one-third of their income and reprimanded me for telling them that they did that for the Lord and God would bless were those people content? 
Those people never complained. That was one of the best churches I ever served in. They just, they were just always so happy. Well, and then when you went to their house, they would serve you fried bananas, which I don't like fried bananas, but they would give you fried bananas. And for many of them to have a bottle of Coke, that was a luxury. But when they knew I was coming, guess what they would always have there? They'd always have a bottle of Coke. They say, Pastor, we know you like Coke. So I said, guys, they said, no, we, we want to honor you. So we will have chicken, fried bananas, and Coke. And, they'd, and then I'd take Johnson with me, because Johnson liked the fried bananas. So they would, pi Andrew and Johnson, both from Liberia. So I would sit there, and I was always courteous, and I'd always, they'd pile them up on the plate, like, do you like the fried bananas? They're okay. <laughs> and so I'd say, Johnson, you like fried bananas? Oh, those are a luxury. Here, take my fried bananas. <laughs> and he'd pile them on his plate, and with a smile on his face, he'd eat them all down. What am I trying to tell you? Commitment is learned by practice and by experience, and also by watching people. Here was a pastor that God was teaching by those who did not have seminary degrees, and yet those people had something that I lacked. And that was learning self-sufficiency in Christ. Learning by experience and by watching these incredible saints of God who deeply loved the Lord and whether they had fried bananas and rice, they would be happy all day. And many of them, that's what they lived with, mostly rice. Then on occasion, chicken during the week, and yet those people never complained. I think we can learn something from that, can't we? This evening, I wanna challenge us. If you're complaining, then you're not what? You're not content. What's the big word in the Ten Commandments? God tells us not to do what with our neighbor's wife, our neighbor's possessions. What's that word? Covet. Oh, yeah, covet. <laughs> covet is wanting something that somebody else has that you don't have and you want. If you have that kind of attitude, then you probably are not very what? Content. If you always think you have to have more, then you're probably not what? Content. Now, again, did I tell you, is there anything wrong with having things? And the answer is what? No. There's nothing wrong with having things. As long as those things don't become what? There you go. You got it. And that we are not driven by our jobs because we are driven people when it comes to work. And again, that doesn't mean you're lazy. But a lot of times, we have a tendency to want more, and we work a lot more. And again, I grew up in a family that worked hard, always. I was taught since I was a kid, you will work, you will work hard, because you are German descent, you will work hard. I go, right, okay, I'll, I'll work, but, but we can go to extremes, can we not? That's what I'm saying. Be careful of extremes, because that can lead to what? discontent, right? And we all need to learn this. That's what I'm learning now, honestly. Um, you know, it's just like, okay, Lord, um, I've got a daughter in college, I've got this and this and this, I do my checkbook, and I go, well, we're going to be short about $600 this month, but guess what? God supplies. God will. God will. And you know what God teaches me? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Amen? And many times God wants to do that in such a powerful way that sometimes he has to humble us and to take things away that are most precious to us so that we learn in all circumstances with lack or much, having opportunity and not having opportunity, that we learn to trust the Lord and be sufficient in him. And how do we learn that? It's through by practice and experience. We're all going through God's class on that, right? And the question is, are you getting an A or are you getting an F? Only you know that. I don't. But that's my challenge for this church. This church has been blessed with 
I mean, gee, you guys are so blessed. I, I go to churches that it's just like the place has fallen down. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like, man, this is bad. And yet God has been so good to this, this group of people. And when God gives so much, then God expects what? Too much is given, much is required. It really is. And it, it's a shame. It's a shame that may God work in our lives so much that this church will be known for the way they give and the way they minister and the way they are constantly, not just church people, but unchurched people, how they're so willing to give and to help those who have little so that we can, because you know what, when you do that, that gives you great opportunities to do what? What did Jesus do with people with physical needs? He met them, and then what did he do? He shared who he was. That's how this church is gonna grow. It really will, because I'm telling you, within a 30 mile radius, there are people who are hurting out there, right? They are. And when God gives so much, when a church is willing to be sufficient in Christ and willing to dedicate all that they have for the kingdom of God, then those people are not only blessed by God, but they will bless others. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for tonight, and thank you for those who are here. Lord, um, we desperately need to trust you in all circumstances. And Lord, we desire to, to be the kind of people that when those who are struggling with affliction and, and just struggling with life, that you have given so much that we can share and to provide, to meet needs of people here in this church and people in the community. I pray challenge uh, this group of believers to be able to accomplish that which you've given them the resources to do. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you.